Thank you. All right, question number six, Sean, we're back to you. Do you agree with the current school board's decision to build a new administrative complex? Can you please explain? Uh, Sean Frost, I, I think I've, I've made that fairly clear that I am not in support of it. Um, it comes back to the servant leader um, concept. We have, we're, we're simultaneously putting kids in portables and building an administration office building. You know, we have to ask ourselves what, what, what business we're in. Is it education or is it administration? Now, I understand that there are carrying costs, there are operating overhead and things like that. I get the realities of it. But do we need it right now? I don't think we do. I think that there are a number of oppor uh, opportunities there that if we look outside the, this is what they presented us, yes, no, maybe so, um, then we can do that. And that takes creativity, that takes innovation, that takes solid leadership. Um, no, I, I think we should not be building car washes, test kitchens, and administration buildings as long as our teachers and students are being treated like refugees in, poor, in temporary buildings. We need to take the best care of our students that we can. That's the whole point of the education system, is to create the next generation of Americans, the next generation of patriots, those who will grow up to be doctors, lawyers, policemen, firemen, Marines. Uh, we need them. We need them and we need to grow them right. And the way we do that is by putting all the money on the kids, with the teachers, with the technology, and not building a Tiffany box for our iMac. Thank you. Randy Heimler. I guess the one thing I regret now in my life is I didn't join the Marines. <laughs> Couldn't use that one for quite a long time. Um, on a serious note, our children belong in buildings. That's where our impact fees goes to permanent student stations. I'm, I'm a big opponent of the portables. I don't like them. I've been in them for a long time, especially down in Miami where they were hurricane smashed. And they were full of mold and mildew, and I wouldn't let Joshua be in a school that had portables. I'm very happy where he is. He's in a a building that actually is over 50 years old as most of our elementary schools were built in the, in the mid 50s or late 50s and a lot of money needs to go there to maintain them but now back to the the question this 7.3 million dollar building could have been avoided very easily if this county would have some cohesiveness which i spoke about at the county commission every entity seems to work independently here the school district is one, the county commissioner is another, the city is a separate one, and everybody seems not to get along so well. I asked this question a bunch of years ago, why didn't the school board join in when they built the county buildings a few years ago? Wouldn't that make sense? We could all go to the same place, we do our driver's license, the county commission, voter registration is down the street, but there are so many facilities there, and there's so much room now, from what I understand, there's vacancies, but the bottom line is if our superintendent of our school district got along with our commission at the time maybe we'd all not be discussing this ever and we would have saved 7.3 million dollars instead of now having to build out in the middle of stone grove um, stone grove so cohesiveness is where we need to go to solve a lot of these problems thank you randy heimler i'm charlie cersei and i am not in favor of the new county administration building there's one little thing that might change the minds of a lot of people. Article 8 of the Florida Constitution says that the, the headquarters for the county facilities is to be located in the county seat. And the last time I looked up where uh, Storm Grove is, that's not the county seat. And I don't know, we, we, we pay an uh, uh, attorney firm $22,000 a month to research and make sure we're making the right legal decisions. Well, folks, if we miss the Constitution, we have missed a real big opportunity to keep that building down here in, in, in this county, or in this uh, city. I'm not in favor of it because, number one, we've got our students, a lot of our students, in dilapidated portable buildings that are not dry, and clean, and safe. That's my understanding. And it's not right to build a, a, a mansion or a fan, fancy place for our administrators and leave our students, and that's what we're all about in this school district, leave them in those dilapidated portals. 
we could take the money, the in, just the interest on that money would be like, if we, if we paid that $7 million down on the bond issues that we have out now, we'd save about $350 to $375 a year, $375,000 a year. Not much money, but it would be a big help in making this district more sound. Thank you, Charlie Searcy. Karen Disney brought that. So I want you to think about your own home for a minute. And you live in a $200,000 home that belongs to someone else. And you were told you need to put over $100,000 of repairs in that home. Would you build a new home with that money? Or would you uh, ask your landlord to do it? Well, we ask our landlord to do it. Our building does not belong to us. Our landlord is the county commission. They, are, they will not fix it. So um, it is not, the, the state of Florida has to approve any building that's built by the school board. And they have told us that we need to build a new building rather than put over three and a half million dollars into renovations and repairs, including a roof, air conditioning, walls from mold, uh, rat uh, damage. This building that we are in was attached to the building the county commission was in that uh, six or however many years ago, they moved out of that building and their side was demolished. And it's been an issue that's been kicked down the road by many boards because it's an unpopular thing to take on. It takes a lot of guts to vote to build an administration building. So we did it because spending three and a half or more million dollars to repair a building that doesn't belong to us doesn't make any sense at all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're on to our last question, number seven. And we'll start with Randy. As a school board member, what day-to-day -day activities would you expect to be involved in? Randy Heimler. This question is right up my alley. Um, as, as I've told you, I plan on being a full-time board member, and I think it's essential in these times. There are too many issues in our community. We need to involve every single community group we possibly can, and all the parents, all the PTAs, to get our schools back on track. Without the participation from this community, it's not going to get any better. Parental involvement is essential to our schools. That is why you're seeing the charter schools excel the way they are. It's mandatory in most of those schools, just like it's mandatory at Rosewood, Osceola, Liberty. That's what drives these schools, the 20 hours or the 10 hours or the 15 hours of parental involvement that the parents have to be there. And guess what in those schools? You don't behave, you're sent out back to your home school. There's your issue. There's a, there's a catch to it. So we need to get all our parents in. Now, how are we going to do that if we're going to be part-time just showing up at meetings and not really being involved? I plan on being out in the community every single day, speaking to every single group I can. Speak to the PTAs, go to the Elks Club, the, every, the Rotary Club. You name the clubs, I'm going. Because that's what we did in Miami. And guess what? We took a double F failing school. From, a du from double F, like I just said, we missed a B by six points only because we brought in big brothers and big sisters, we brought in the police, we brought in everybody we could find to, to mentor those children and participate. And without it, we're not going anywhere. Trust me, we're gonna be mediocre forever. So there's what I plan on doing. I plan on talking to the teachers every single day. I'm not gonna be in the classrooms with them, but I wanna know what's going on. And if you don't know what your employees are, are doing, then you have no chance of working your corporation, let's call it that. Thank you, Randy Heinlein. Well, I don't plan to be a full-time board member, but I can tell you from experience, when I served on the board in 1996 to 2000, you wind up with plenty of opportunities to be out in the community and listening to what's going on. And believe it or not, you have a lot of time to listen at home because your phone will ring all the time and now with emails and facebook and all you will be hearing what's going on 
it's important for our teachers to have the feeling that they can talk to someone. And in, in years past, I mean, probably not too many nights went by that I didn't get calls from teachers. They're all afraid if they say something, the criticism may come down to the superintendent. We're going to hire a superintendent. We're probably going to pay him one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars a year. That is who's going to be running the school district. We're going to be making policies, and most of them have to be uh, recommended by the superintendent. But for us to have another micromanager out in the school system is just not the way that it ought to be. We're policy makers. We have to deal with the politics. Let us do our job. Let the superintendent carry out the policies we have. And I'm telling you, if we get the right superintendent, this district is going to go back from the A's that we had, now down to the B, down to the C this year, we're going to go back to the top. But an exciting cheerleading superintendent is going to make this district what it needs to be, what it needs to be and what we all want it to be. I'm Charlie Searcy. Thank you. I'm Karen Disney Brownback, and I can tell you what school board members do. Um, at our organizational meeting in November, the uh, chairman will assign the board members to different committees, such as the planning and zoning, the MPO, um, the different um, um, le uh, legislative meetings that we need to go to. We, as a group, vote on who's going to be the legislative liaison. We, uh, by, by the statutes, only need to attend the board meetings and our job is to pass the budget. But I tell you, as a board member, you can't do those things unless you're out talking to people. Um, I spent a great deal of time as a legislative liaison traveling to Tallahassee and Washington on behalf of our school board. Um, it was a matter of uh, carrying our messages and um, learning about the different impacts that laws were going to have and being able to communicate those things to the, our constituents and community members so they knew what to expect. Um, one of the things I, I feel like I wish I had done better is uh, spend more time in, out with the community. Um, it is, there are just so many things to do and board members can choose as, as much or as little as they want to do. But I know I made sure I went to all the graduations and any time I was invited to a school by a teacher to go in the classroom, I made sure I did that. And to the best of my ability, I attended as many meetings as I was as I could and all that I was assigned to do. So um, it is it, it can be a full time job if you choose to. Um, it's not required to be, but um, there's a lot going on out there. Thank you. This is Sean Frost, and I think you just heard uh, a fundamental difference uh, between the way we would do things. Um, my opponent has spent a lot of time in legislature, and she thinks that's, that's right. That's clearly something in which she believes. I believe a little differently. And the reason I, I believe that is because I'm actually out in the community all the time, uh, both myself and my campaign team, we're constantly hearing about the lack of responsiveness from our school board, the lack of transparency, how emails and phone calls aren't being returned. And that's understandable if one is traveling a lot with a busy travel schedule. Uh, so perhaps being in the district is the way to go. What would I do? I would do what I've always done, try to solve problems. Let God guide my heart, my hands, and my feet as I move forward to serve the people. That is my goal. It's not to, to move up in any political organization. It's to work hard for you to bring about your vision for our students, for our future, for the future of America, so that we will be strong. We won't fall to the wayside, as President Reagan warned, that we're only one generation away from losing our freedom. I think we're a lot closer than one generation. And we need strong leadership, like Sean Frost, to stop it in its tracks to preserve our rights to preserve parental rights to preserve our democracy and this republic and that's what you can learn about at frostplan.com how we're going to do that and we're going to work together to take back our school board thank you thank you <clears throat> all right that concludes the tea party's questions Thank you, candidates. We are now going to move on, and we'll just continue. So 
Charlie, you got the first question, all right? So we'll just continue to rotate. We'll see how many we can get in. Now I have two questions here that are similar, so I'm going to kind of blend them because they seem to want to ask the same thing. And they both kind of rail on history and the way it's taught and that it's uh, mainly focused on American history and uh, why it's not, uh, why don't you teach World War II? How can you skip the Holocaust? Uh, one talks about the ways of the world, the book by Robert Strayer, and it refers to Mao, Hitler, and collectivism not being so bad. So will you agree to review textbooks, making sure they are factually correct? Well, I'm not going to try to ramble like you did, uh, by the way. Uh, but, and I'm not really sure what the question is, but as far as reviewing the, reviewing the textbooks, I think it's important that we have folks that are interested in the history that we're taking, the teaching in our school. I think the veterans groups in our community would volunteer in a heartbeat to, to volunteer to be, uh, to be reviewing the textbooks. That is one thing that I hear a lot, that we're not teaching uh, American history anymore. But it all gets back down to the bottom line. If our kids can't read, it doesn't matter what te what you're teaching. But if our kids can't read, they're going to miss them. I mean, they're going to miss their whole school experience. So would I? I hope this is answering the question now, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I would be in favor of, of the board and and some veterans group and other folks that want to be participating, uh, reviewing the textbooks to make sure that the history that we're teaching is accurate and complete. I'm Charlie Sursen. Thank you. Well, I'm always happy to review a textbook. Uh, the way our history is taught is it starts out in elementary school where there are standards, and, and not, the, not from Common Core. These are Florida Sunshine State standards, which are now Florida standards, have been in, on the books for uh, since the 80s. Uh, those standards. Uh, tell elementary teachers to have certain items in their lessons. And the teachers create a lesson plan about, about uh, things, uh, possibly uh, the branches of government, so that sort of thing. And then in eighth grade, again, the students have U.S. history. And then as a senior, they have two different um, classes in history. It's broken up by semester. One part of it is government and one part of it is economics. So the students are getting history. Um, the books are reviewed by a teacher review committee. All books are uh, selected by a committee before they're purchased. And it is um, a combination of the teachers who teach that class as well as administrators. And um, they, they actually do read the books. Um, we do have a system in place for a book challenge. If a parent reads something in a book that is objectionable, they come to us, they point it out. We, um, we spend about six months on a book review and then make a final determination if this is a book that should stay in our public school. So the process is in place and um, I invite you to come by the district office and look at those standards because they do exist and um, are being taught in our schools uh, by curriculum um, and lesson plans designed by our teachers. Sean Frost, I didn't teach uh, history, I taught science. So I can't uh, speak to that as well. But uh, did you know that the president has the power to declare war? That's what has been taught to my daughter. Uh, that's a bit of a problem for me, you know, that's not enumerated in our constitution. Uh, but it's a struggle, it really is. Now, there are opportunities for parents to be involved, um, as you just heard. I would, I would support strengthening that because this is a community issue and it should be treated as such. We need to bring parents in, teachers in, who are subject matter experts, even bring in professors, things along those lines to help make these decisions. Now, uh, what we're seeing with what's not being called Common Core anymore, it's uh, Florida Standards, is you can choose from this Pearson book or another Pearson book by a different name, whether it's Houghton, Mith uh, Houghton Mifflin or something else, and they're basically the same. Now, I've, I've seen the same things on the internet that uh, we, we just heard about, whether it's calling our founding fathers uh, similar to being the leaders of Hamas, 
uh, or denying the Holocaust, things along those lines. I take them with a grain of salt. I want to see them and hold them in my hand, and I appreciate the opportunity with the title to actually go back and look them over uh, because that's something that we can't have. We need to teach American history as such with pride as Americans. Thank you. Visit frostplan.com. Randy Heimler. Now, the beauty of this is I actually have a third grader who I learn from every single day. So there's a lot of misinformation out there about what's being taught, what's not being taught, what's in the books, what's not being in the books. But Mrs. Dillon dresses up like King George every year, and they actually teach all about the tea party. Joshua participates in that all the time. We do teach history. I think we could get back up because we have some very important people here from the Educators Association that would confirm that. So he has learned about the Louisiana Purchase, the War of 1812, World War One, World War II. He has taught me things that I haven't remembered in a long time. Somebody mentioned the Holocaust. We should teach about the Holocaust. We shouldn't hide anything from what's happened in history. But if you participate every day in the school system, and you're on campus, and you're involved in your children's education, you will see that we are actually teaching things that people think we're not teaching. But that's the vital part of this whole thing. You've got to be involved. And without our parents being involved, and without participating in their education and being on those campuses, you're not going to know what's going on. So that's where I'm at here. There is a lot of misinformation, but I think we're doing a very, a very good job of teaching history from what I've learned. And at Rosewood, it's called core knowledge. They build on it every single year. So whatever they learn at first, they expand on second, third, fourth, and all the way up. And I think that's really cool. And I think that's the way they get it. And I'm very impressed by that. Thank you. I'm Randy Heinlein. All right. Next question, we're going to start with you, Karen. Appraising teachers based on student outcomes is similar to what each of us encounter in our careers. Why is this not appropriate? There are some things that teachers have control over in their classrooms and some of them have some things that they don't. And one of the things that student teachers don't have control over is who comes in and sits down in the seats in front of them. And with each student become, comes a, uh, a, ver a variety of experiences, um, the influences of their family, the uh, influences of poverty, the influences of, of illness. And so those things are going to affect the teacher, uh, or the teaching that goes on, or the learning that goes on, I should say. Um, I, I know that teachers need to be evaluated, that children must have the best teachers each and every year that they're in schools. Children cannot afford to have a year with an ineffective teacher. But the way that we have arranged it right now has um, impacted teachers in a negative way. We have very good teachers who are getting evaluations that reflect on them as if they're not good teachers. And we have some teachers that, that maybe are um, uh, not deserving of, of, of a high score that are getting it. And we've got to fix that. So the evaluation system that's in place uh, may or may not have to be uh, scrapped and started over again, but it most certainly needs an overhaul because um, we can't afford to lose the good teachers that we have. I'm Sean Frost, and as a teacher, I can tell you specifically why this is a problem. Has anyone here ever had a boss who's a jerk? A, a boss who's a jerk? You, you don't have to raise your hand. It's, it's rhetorical, but I see you back there. Um, have you ever had a boss who's awesome, and who loves you, and you play basketball, and you do all sorts of really cool things together? Um, that's the problem. Uh, when I met with the, the uh, teachers, one of the things they brought up is that it's not the assessment tool isn't being evenly administered. So if you see uh, someone, a boss, if you will, a site supervisor, the, the principal or AP, who's reviewing that teacher, and that all of their teachers are rated the highest, or um, uh, uh, what's, uh, highly, 
Highly effective, sorry, thank you. It's, it's been seven years since I taught. Uh, highly effective. And you see another administrator who has no teachers who are highly effective. Now, you have to look at their hiring practices. Are you hiring all highly effective teachers? And if so, we want to figure out how to do that. And Or are you hiring really bad teachers? And perhaps we need to look at a shift in leadership. Uh, as a teacher, I can tell you, I taught science. My bonus, my at-risk compensation, was tied to something over which I had absolutely no control. As a science teacher, I was responsible for ninth grade reading games in order to get a bonus. Now, although all the literature will tell you that most reading games are made by fifth grade, it's unfair to hold a teacher accountable for something that they can't. Should they be held accountable? Yes, but not for something over which they have no control. It needs to be revamped. Thank you. Besides Ms. Disney, who was a board member, I'm the only candidate that attended all the impasse hearings when the teachers were fighting for their contract with the district. And the learning experience I got from attending those impasse hearings was unbelievable. I never would want to be a board member without going through that process for, as a spectator first. What the district did with the teachers, to me, was unconscionable. To declare impasse on our teachers and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars throughout the legal process, there's just no way to do that and think your employees are going to respond in a positive way. The way our teachers have been treated in this district in particular has been horrible. They ask for a 2% raise and they go to impasse on the 2% raise, which by the way is $600, $700, $800. That's all it is. They can't even get a cost of living raise. It's not fair. The teachers have endorsed me and only me because they know I believe in them. And if we don't raise their morale and have someone that they can come to, which they haven't had in many, many, many years, then we're never gonna change our district because their morale is never gonna change. They are scared to do their evaluations. They're scared to come forward with any complaints. They don't go to their principals because they're worried they're gonna be banished. They're on one-year contracts, the new teachers, believe it or not. They have no job security. Two years of being ineffective, they're gone. How's that, you wanna become a teacher? I don't think so. They're leaving in droves. Yes, we have the highest average salary on the Treasure Coast for our teachers. Guess what, but they have no job security. So I'm very proud of my endorsement from the teachers, but I think their evaluation system is horrible. They asked for a one-year hold on it a freeze because they were evaluated on a, on a system that they didn't even know was coming into place. How fair is that? It's not. So I'm against the evaluation system and I hope to work for one that's really fair. Thank you, Randy Heimler. Teachers don't get in the teaching profession to get rich. Teachers teach because they love what they do. At least the ones that taught me did that. I'm not so sure that it's not fair, but I think it is fair to, to grade teachers on the performance of their children. They should not be the performance of every child is not the same, but every child should improve and if a teacher is given a full mix of students and every one of those students improve, I think the teacher's doing a good job. And I think our the reviewers, whoever they're going to be, would recognize that. The thing about the incoming tide, all boats float, you know, that's kind of a neat thing. But teachers need to be given the opportunity to do what they do best, and that is teach our students. They need to quit worrying about Quit, quit worrying about how am I going to be how am I going to be great? If they would teach to the best of their ability, they would need to worry about that because the success that they have is going to show their students are going to learn, and I think all of the folks will be happy. Well, no, they're never all happy. I'm sorry, I take that back. But we would uh, we would have a happy school district if they would quit worrying about how they're going to be. Uh, you and whether or not they're going to fail. Just teach our kids what you know and what you love to do. I'm Charlie Searcy. Thank you. All right, we're
we're going to squeeze one more question in. We're going to start with you, Sean. Okay. Do you support three to four year old public education? Why or why not? It's a great question. Um, the data suggests that it does have improvements. What I don't support is uh, kindergartners being given standardized tests. One thing we've seen, uh, I was talking with a teacher who said for the first time, and she actually broke down into tears in front of me, uh, for the first time she saw terror in her students' eyes when told them they would have 20 minutes to complete this standardized test. What, you know, my daughter uh, had a, the first night she had to take the FCAT was up all night vomiting as a result of the pressure put on her. And she sure didn't get it from mom and dad because we love her no matter what and she's brilliant. She's always gotten fives on whatever, FCAT, FCAT 2.0, the end of course evaluation. But we need to nurture every child. Now as far as third and, uh, three and four year olds, I don't know that that should be part of uh, the public education system. But if the data suggests that it makes them better rounded students, we have to look at that. Um, what we need to do is get away from Common Core and all the ridiculousness of it, keep the standards, in fact, raise the standards. But we need to do away with the destructive portions of it, like the over-reliance on standardized testing and how we treat our students and the teachers as a result of those things. We're overusing them. The tail is wagging the dog. We need to get rid of Common Core and return to common sense and work together to take back our schools. And the first thing to do for that is to vote for Frost. Thank you. This is an, uh, Randy Heinemann. This is a very dear to my heart initiative that I've been part of for a long time out of Miami when they did this back in 1999, the early, early childhood initiatives in the VBK when Manny, when um, Alex Pinellas was the mayor, brought, brought in legislation for that, that every four-year-old was entitled to 500 hours of education paid for by the state. It is vital to the success of our students to have third and fourth, third, three years and four year old students in school learning. I spoke to the people in charge here for the VBK program. We only have about 170 seats. I, I'm, I'm taking a, an educated guess what I remember that our four-year-olds can go to in our public school system in the VBK program. When I speak to parents, I see them all the time with the little ones, I say, is your child in VBK? They always ask me, what's VBK? Voluntary pre-K. Four years old, you get 500 hours, and if you get into the school system version, you get the whole year. How good is that? Why don't we have more funding and put every child, we have a waiting list in this county for VBK. That's unbelievable to me. Now, I just have to address one thing. Our teachers teach every day to the best of their ability in the worst conditions possible. So for someone to say that they, if they taught to their best ability and to their highest standards all the time, we'd be just fine. It's ridiculous. That is why the teachers endorse me. That's why they mailed over a thousand mailers today that have the pros for me and the cons for my opponent. You can't make statements like that and think that you're going to win over our teachers. Our teachers are dying in those classrooms every day. They are under the worst conditions you could possibly imagine without any support. We don't enforce the code of conduct. They have no recourse. It's incredible to me. Our teachers are the best civil servants with the firemen and the policemen and we disrespect them all the time. Come on now. We need to, re to support our teachers because without them, guess what? Our children are not going to survive and, and make it. We, our kids spend more waking hours with our teachers than they do with us. How's that one? Thank you. Randy Heimler. Uh, well, I'm glad you folks got an interpretation of what I said a few minutes ago. Um, but I would say I'm not in favor of teaching three and four year old kids, their children, let children be children. Whenever they get our school system is called, we, we describe it as K through 12. Let's take those kindergarten students and move them on through through 12. Teach them how to read early on. But give our kids. I mean, let let them be kids. You know, 
you remember back in your school days, and some of you folks would have to remember a long ways back, by the way, uh, Zach Fulmer would probably have to remember a long way back, but we were kids. A lot of us had to go out and work when we were kids, but, but we just need to let our kids be kids. You know, if, if, if the district or the state can show me that there, there is evidence that those children that come in and three and four year olds, they are smarter and can read better and do everything better because they were, they started out in, in, at age three and four, I might change my mind on that, but you can't prove it to me yet. They just let them be kids. I mean, you know, we, we're worried about funding for teachers and everything else. The more we take on, the more we've got to fund and this free stuff, let me tell you, it ain't free. This is Charlie Searson. Thank you. Hi, uh, Karen Disney brought back. So statutorily, we must provide services to three-year-olds that are in need of services. There are, uh, a, there's a group called um, Early Steps that identify these students through different channels, perhaps their daycare refers them, it may be the physician that refers them, or it could be a parent, some refers. And these, these children are, are having developmental difficulties, and so they are referred to early steps, and on their third birthday, they're eligible to start the ESE three-year-old program in our public schools. So uh, they have full-time teacher, they have uh, uh, other ESC services like speech and uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy. And the purpose is to bring them up to speed so that when they become kindergartners, they're able to be on the grade level. Because oftentimes these developmental difficulties, they start out early, but these kids keep, can catch up and then not have that cycle of failure that they would otherwise have. We have four-year-olds four through the VPK program and um, those 119 students that we have in the BPK are not counted in the count you hear when you hear about our 17,000 students versus, uh, um, there's actually 19,000 students, if you will, um, in the district that receives some services because we have, even have infants that we pay for their daycare so their parents can go to school. These are in the statutes. The school district must do it. We must provide the services. And we have a school spe full spectrum of care from birth to 22. All right, thank you. We're just about out of time, so you can move into your closing statements. Uh, Sean, you went first last, so Randy will start the closing statements with you. And 90 seconds, please. First of all, I wanna thank everybody. I'm Randy Heimler, as I've said about 22 times tonight. Thank everybody for coming out tonight. I know it's uh, sometimes you have many other things, but this is one of the most important seats and positions in our county. It's our children we're talking about. We're not talking about buildings anymore. We're not talking about anything else. We're talking about our children. Our children that are three and four years old that we're able to provide services for and get them started. There are so many studies that prove early childhood is essential. We're 28th or 29th in the world now. So if we let our kids be kids, why don't we just jump down to 50? We don't care, but I do. Joshua, thank goodness, was, was three years old and he went into the ESE department for speech. And guess what? He's up to speed. Had we not done that and that service not been provided for him, he would have been so far behind in kindergarten, he probably would have been retained. So if we don't want to focus on what we really need to do here, and we don't really know what we're, we're talking about here, we're not gonna be able to help our children. I was the state volunteer of the year. I taught out of need and I donated back my entire salary while I was in Miami. I became a PTA president. I chaired the Miami, the city of Miami Beach advisory board for the convention center. I chaired the, the, the Miami Day District's strategic planning committee. Not by myself, I was nominated and I served with some of the most important people in Miami Day, which I plan on continuing to up here. I volunteered every day last year at Rosewood Elementary directing traffic in their parking lot because it was so dangerous. So for an hour every day I was out there in the hot sun so Mrs. Dillon, the principal, should actually be able to go back into school and do what she's supposed to do. That's what I'm about. 
And that's what you're going to get from me every single day. Emails, phone calls, you name it, I'm going to be there. And that's what's important. But I'm going to focus on the children. That's what we need to be here for. So in the next couple weeks, which we're coming up to, please get out there and vote. Early voting starts on Friday. Election day for us is only one time, August 26th. We don't go to the general. So if you don't vote now, you're not going to have a chance to vote for us. So please, on August 26th, come out and support me. I have the support of a lot of groups here. The teachers are the number one for me. The realtors are behind me as well. And I appreciate the public support as, as, as well. Thank you very much. Again, I'm Randy Heimler, School Board District 4. Thank you very much. I'm Charlie Searcy, and uh, again, thank you for being here tonight. What do you say to voters who are going to have to go make a decision about somebody country boy like me that's never saved a school down in Miami. I've spent my 35 years in this community working with teachers, with parents, with students, and I've done it all, folks. I, if, I was the, if I was the savior of the world in saving schools, I think the governor would appoint me to be the, the guru in Tallahassee to save all the failing schools. That didn't happen because I was here in this county up here working with teachers and I know they don't want to hear it, some of them, but they can't say that I didn't support them. In my four years on the school district, we never went to impasse with the teachers, period. They can say I didn't support them. Well, I think that's pretty good support. We had a superintendent that was tough, but we got it done. We've got to have school board members that care about our community I have shown through the years that I do, and if you will support me and elect me to school board, I promise you, you will have a good school board member that will respond to you, will answer questions, and will be firm and fair with you, with our students, and our, our public. Thank you. This is Charlie Searcy, and I appreciate your vote on August 26th. Thanks. I'm Karen Disney Brombach, and I've faithfully served the school district for eight years as a school board member. But it started long before that. When my kids were in school, I was a, a 500 hour plus volunteer every year. 2000, I was district volunteer of the year. And um, always tried to find ways to advocate for children, education, and health. So um, when I became a school board member, um, the being elected by the school board to be the, le the legislative liaison was a natural fit for the experiences I had had um, advocating in Tallahassee for my own son who has special needs. The um, experience has been wonderful and it also um, is necessary going forward. I've been through two, two superintendent searches. The other board members um, have been through, the two of them have been through one and the governor's appointee hasn't been through one at all. So it's going to be necessary to have that experience um, to guide our board. Um, I, I think, I, I believe, I know I've earned the trust of the public because I haven't always told the public what they want to hear, but I've always told them the truth. And that kind of trust is earned. There have been some things said tonight that aren't accurate, and if you're basing your vote on any of us on some of these things, you need to contact the school district. We do hard bids. Not always, but we do hard bids. We um, don't have what sounds like an uh, enterprise car wash. We have a, a shed with a hose on it to clean out a garbage truck. Um, we Charter schools are public schools. And I urge you to contact the district, learn the truth, and um, please support me on August 26th. Thank you. This is Sean R. Frost, and this is one last bid for your vote. If you feel our schools are better off now than they were eight years ago, then continue down the path we're on. If you're ready for real conservative change, to take back our schools, to be involved in education, to put kids first, to stop wasteful spending, to have a, a school board member who's going to be in the district, working hard for you, meeting with teachers, listening to you, running into you at Publix, it's already happening on the campaign trail, then the choice is clear. Vote for Sean Frost. Now, 
My path began long ago on Paris Island. On this day, 20 years ago, I became a United States Marine. I served with honor, courage, commitment. I was entrusted with a top secret clearance and I worked hard for the citizens of this country. I came back here because I love this county. I've lived here my entire life other than my time in the Marine Corps and attending college where I earned my master's in business administration. I have a lifetime GPA of 3.91. I am a top achiever. I want to work hard for you. But most importantly, what I want you to know is I'm in this for Blaze Frost and Hattie Frost and all of your children, grandchildren, and being a, a stalwart steward and watchful eye on the budget. I want to make sure that there's smarter school spending. And if you want to see photos of this garden hose, please go visit smarterschoolspending.com. There's a whole blog post about it. It's colossal. It's two giant bays, and it cost $13 million. As, uh, it didn't cost $13 million. It was part of a $13 million complex. I want you to go to frostplan.com and get out and vote for Sean R. Frost if you are ready for change and you've had enough with declining grades and increasing budgets. I humbly ask for the opportunity to continue serving you as a school board member. Vote for SeanRFrost.com. Thank you. All right, thank you candidates. As you can tell, politics may not be a total contact sport, but it's not far from it. Um, so, I think history has proven that um, our national and our state politics, that character counts. And the Tea Party is all about our founding principles and a strong moral compass to stay on course. So character does count. I encourage you to listen to what each candidate says. But I also, in today's world, you can do your own research. So you need to understand who the candidates are, what their past has been, where they're from, what their principles are, and that will guide you as to, after we've elected them, better to understand the positions they will take. As you can tell, I'm a little disappointed in some of our federal and state individuals, but I applaud these individuals for being here tonight. I think they uh, handled themselves well. Thank you for our, your time, candidates. Um, thank you for taking the questions. Audience, thank you for being here. Those listening on the radio, thank you. We'd like to thank the Heritage Center once again. This is the Indian River Tea Party. Thank you for being here. Good night.